I'm Eddie Muller, TCM's very own film noir tout. You want to bet a sure thing? Then skip Red Lightning in the seventh and put all your money on the killing. Today's entry in the Noir Alley sweepstakes. The world's most respected movie handicappers all have this one either win, place, or show on the list of all-time great heist movies. But to say that it was a sure thing out of the gate would be very misleading. This was the third feature by a young New York photographer turned filmmaker, Stanley Kubrick. But the first time that he was gambling with Hollywood money, which always has strings attached. For an artist as fiercely independent as Kubrick, there were bound to be some hurdles. The director had begun his professional career as a photographer for Look magazine, and his work not only showed an instinctive eye for dramatic lighting and composition, but a sensibility forged in no small measure by movies he'd watched in Manhattan's movie palaces and art houses. His first two films, Fear and Desire and Killer's Kiss, were the work of a young man who'd seen more than his share of noir. Now, you veteran TCM viewers have at least seen bits and pieces of Killer's Kiss because TCM used the film's evocative location shots as a lead-in to the network's Movies After Dark series. Like many young independent filmmakers who'd follow in his footsteps for generations to come, Stanley Kubrick made Film Noir his Hollywood calling card. For his source material, Kubrick chose the novel Clean Break by prolific pulp fiction writer Lionel White. Now, White was the literary equivalent of a B-movie maker, cranking out thrilling, fast-paced novels for low-rent houses such as Gold Medal and Lion Books. And what separated White from his colleagues, and what I am sure attracted Kubrick to Clean Break, was his fascination with non-linear narratives. While his plots were often pedestrian, and he wasn't above swiping storylines from movies, White's narratives were unique for the way the action often backtracked and overlapped from different characters' perspectives. And Kubrick's decision to maintain this unusual device would result in his locking horns with executives at United Artists, the film's distributor, which had put up money for what it thought was a straightforward, low-budget heist picture. To add even another layer of hard-boiled authenticity, Kubrick hired another Pulp Fiction specialist to write the screenplay. Jim Thompson is now considered one of the masters of American noir, but at the time, he was just another bitter, alcoholic wordsmith living on paltry advances for paperback originals like Savage Night, The Grifters, and The Killer Inside Me. Kudos to Kubrick for recognizing Thompson's affinity for desperate characters and the great gallows humor in his dialogue. The writer, unfortunately, had a nasty falling out with the director after Kubrick took a screenwriting credit and reduced Thompson's contribution to merely dialogue by. Well, they either buried the hatchet or Thompson was really hard up for money because he'd work with Kubrick again two years later, writing the screen adaptation of Humphrey Cobb's novel Paths of Glory, which would truly be Kubrick's breakout film. Now, the casting of The Killing is ample proof that Stanley Kubrick loved film noir. The crew he assembled for this caper is a veritable who's who of the genre. Sterling Hayden was fast approaching his last bankable day as a leading man, but here Kubrick gives him a second chance at the big score that eluded him in the asphalt jungle. The character of Johnny Clay is a smarter and craftier big city cousin of the hayseed hooligan Hayden played in John Huston's classic. But will he be any luckier? Now, give or take a few thousand, I figured the loot on this deal at two million. Colleen Gray, who was introduced in film noir classics Kiss of Death and Nightmare Alley, rates second billing as Hayden's almost angelic girlfriend. She was always the lone ray of light in noir's dismal demi -monde. But Colleen herself admitted she was not the female lead in this movie. That would be Marie Windsor, Kubrick's first and only choice for the pivotal role of low-rent femme fatale, Sherry Peaty. 
The only thing that could have made Marie's performance any better is if she got to play opposite another genre icon. And wouldn't you know it, as her Weasley, weak-willed husband, Kubrick cast the avatar of weak-willed weasels everywhere, Elijah Cook Jr. And their scenes together, slinging Thompson's brutal barbs, are domestic life at its most dire. A marriage made in film noir hell. Why did you ever marry me anyway? Oh, George, when a man has to ask his wife that, well, he just hadn't met her, that's all. Why well, talk about it? Maybe it's all to the good in the long run. After all, if people didn't have headaches, what would happen to the aspirin industry? Kubrick stacks his deck with a hand-picked rogues gallery, all familiar from dozens of noirs. Jay Adler, Tito Vuolo, Joe Turkle, Joe Sawyer, J.C. Flippin, and a pair of wild cards in the mix that give bizarre and unforgettable performances. Cola Quariani as Maurice Obakoff. You may need subtitles, even though he's speaking English. And Timothy Carey as sharpshooter Nicky Arano. Now, I'll have more to say about those gentlemen on the back end of the show. When Kubrick turned in his final cut, United Artist was outraged and demanded he restructure the film so it wouldn't confuse audiences. And after a bit of back and forth, Kubrick held his ground, keeping the structure as it was in Lionel White's novel. And rather than spend any more money to re-edit the film, United Artists dumped it on the bottom half of Double Bills with a Robert Mitchum Western, Bandito, directed by Richard Fleischer, himself only five years away from having made his bones with a bundle of terrific B-crime movies. This film represents the precise crossroads between first-generation film noir and the coming of a fresh tide of filmmakers influenced by classic Hollywood but operating outside its studio constraints. Things started to change in 1956, the year Stanley Kubrick pulled off the killing. You know how some people said that after seeing Psycho, they couldn't take a shower without locking the bathroom door? Well, I can never latch anything without thinking of poor Johnny Clay in his secondhand suitcase. Now, that ending is clearly a nod to the treasure of the Sierra Madre, one of several examples in the movie of Kubrick acknowledging films and filmmakers who'd inspired him. Now, one thing the director did not want was the expository voiceover provided by Art Gilmore. But United Artists insisted on it, fearing audiences would lose their bearings without a narrator explaining the backtracking flow of the action. Of course, this non-linear technique would become fairly common by 1992 when Quentin Tarantino used it to tell his fragmented high story, Reservoir Dogs. On his first two features, Kubrick had done his own camera work. With this one being shot in Hollywood, he was obligated to hire a union DP, in this case, veteran cinematographer Lucien Ballard, who'd been shooting films since the early 30s. The blending of old-school craftsmanship and a more maverick approach to movie making was fraught with tension. Ballard resented being questioned by a young upstart, and pretty soon he stopped watching the dailies, feeling Kubrick's notions of composition and camera movement were embarrassing. And when it came to filming the big shootout, Kubrick wanted the camera to linger over the fallen bodies like gun smoke drifting in the air. It required shooting the scene with a handheld camera, something the old pro found ridiculously amateurish. So Kubrick told Ballard to take a hike, and he handled the camera himself. Even at this early stage of his career, Kubrick was a perfectionist, insisting on precisely what he wanted and never settling for less. That's also why production was delayed for a couple of weeks. Kubrick wanted Marie Windsor, who was on location in Louisiana shooting Swamp Women. He'd settle for no one else, and I'm sure we all agree that Marie turned in her signature performance, even if she's a blonde. Windsor expected this to boost her career, which had declined along with the film noir movement by the mid-50s. And plenty of critics recognized Kubrick's film as a flash of exciting new energy, and just as many touted Marie 
for a Best Supporting Actress Oscar. But she didn't get the nomination she'd hoped for, largely because acrimony between Kubrick and United Artists killed any hope of the distributor campaigning on the film's behalf. One of the more distinctive bits of casting is the brawling distraction provided by Johnny's old pal, Maurice Obakoff, played with a virtually impenetrable dialect by Kola Quariani. You have undoubtedly heard of the Siberian god Heather who tried to discover the true nature of the sun. He stared up at the heavenly body until it made him blind. It's no coincidence that his introductory scene is set in a chess club, since that's where Kubrick met Quariani back when the future director haunted such clubs in his native New York. I've always thought somebody should have made a noir wrestling saga starring Kola Quariani and Stanislas Zabisco, who played Gregorius the Great in Night in the City. The only problem is that the entire film would have to be subtitled. Now, the nod for strangest cast member, however, goes hands down to Timothy Carey. Tales of Carey's oddball behavior are legend. Well, who you betting on, mister? Anything look good to you? Red Lightning, huh? Red Lightning in the seventh. On the set of East of Eden, he refused Ilya Kazan's instructions to enunciate his lines because according to the actor, that's how pimps talk. Kazan ended up stabbing Carrie with a ballpoint pen. The actor had a notorious reputation for improvising within scenes without telling the other actors beforehand. But he was unrivaled in the 1950s for playing characters who expressed their nuttiness in utterly unexpected ways. He brought a bizarre edginess to every role. The only downside was that there was no off position on his crazy switch. Like Lawrence Tierney, Tim Carey ended up being cast only by directors willing to play with fire to get that unique Carey cocktail on screen. An unhinged blend of scariness, vulnerability, and uncontrolled lunacy. Kubrick was willing. He cast Carey again as one of the court-martialed soldiers in his World War I classic, Paths of Glory. Carey would later become an independent filmmaker himself, writing, directing, and starring in the world's greatest sinner, the room of its era, an amateurish and almost incomprehensible movie that still managed to predict the coming of Charles Manson and the dark side of celebrity warship, with a soundtrack composed by a pre-mothers of invention, Frank Zappa. Wrapping up, I want to mention the vital role producer James B. Harris played, not only in this film, but in all of Stanley Kubrick's early movies. They'd found each other in New York and became producing and directing partners, and Harris was essential to Kubrick's ascent as a major talent. After Kubrick zoomed to the A-list, taking over production of Spartacus from Anthony Mann, Harris would forge his own solo career, which has included directing such films as The Bedford Incident, Walking Tall, Cop, and Boiling Point. And he's still around at 90 years of age, and last time I saw him, he was still looking for good crime yarns to turn into movies. So, do you think The Killing is the best heist movie ever? How about sharing a list of your favorites over on the Noir Alley Facebook page or Twitter feed? I'll be weighing in with my picks momentarily. And next week, I'll be back with an arty picture from 1946, Crack Up, in which Pat O'Brien loses his marbles in a train wreck, only to have everybody tell him, it never happened. In other words, my typical Friday commute. We'll see you then.